on behalf of the people of the Twelve Colonies, I surrender. Today we'll be taking a look at the Battlestar Galactica reimagined episodes Crossroads Part 1 and Part 2. This is where Gaius Baltar was put on trial for murder. For now, I'm going to focus on the trial and the Baltar administration's part in the occupation of New Caprica and not discuss the original fall of the colonies. Though don't worry, that day will come. Was Baltar a traitor to humanity? Did his actions result in the deaths of innocent civilians and freedom fighters? Or was he a patsy that ultimately saved the lives of all the people on New Caprica? Yes. In order to appropriately understand the context of the trial, we have to know the background first. While on the run from the Cylons, the Colonials ultimately find their way to a planet that could sustain life and is inside of a nebula that makes it hard to detect any vessels. At the time, there are presidential elections occurring and this issue becomes the deciding factor. Baltar is made president and they colonize what would become known as New Caprica. Unfortunately, the Cylons find the humans and instead of having a Fall of the Colonies Part 2, the Cylons Cylons occupy the planet. In order to appease their fictional god and for this all to work, the Baltar government is forced to agree to an alliance with the Cylons, and is forced to endorse policies that are set out by the invaders. This includes, but is not limited to, removing rations, healthcare, signing execution orders, and more. While some within Baltar's government resisted, Gaius would, sometimes unwillingly, acquiesce to the demands of the Cylons. Baltar never tried to resist them in secret nor publicly. When the Colonials ultimately escaped, Baltar stays with the Cylons, at least for a time. Understandably, this episode is pretty divisive. Many will say that Baltar had no choice, while others postulate that he should have resisted. Let's break down the trial itself. One of the most confusing pieces of the court system to people who don't study it is the concept of beyond a reasonable doubt. This is an extremely high mark that should very rarely be able to be breached. Reasonable doubt is far more common than people believe. For instance, if hypothetically someone was elected to office and showed little to no ability to hide cover-ups and was not politically savvy, it would not be beyond a reasonable doubt to assume that if it was shown that a rival government put him into power, that he was simply a patsy and not some ominous power broker. Just saying. To give better clarity, in a lot of civil cases, juries and judges are held to a standard known as preponderance of the evidence. This generally means that a judge or jury will side on the plaintiff if the evidence shows it's more likely than not. Beyond a reasonable doubt is much different. Even if the evidence shows that it is more likely an event took place, you cannot find someone guilty if there is a doubt that is reasonable that they didn't. If it appears that they are 99% guilty, that 1% of doubt will let them off. All of the evidence could point to an event and ultimately the defendant is let go if there is a fraction of a reasonable doubt there. I'm not gonna get into whether this is a great justice system or not. I just delineated it here so that we can take that into mind when looking at Baltar. So with that out of the way, Let's just get into it. Forty-four thousand and thirty-five. The sum total of survivors from the 12 colonies who settled on New Caprica with President Gaius Baltar as their leader and protector. 38,838. Our number the day after we escaped. And the missing number? The one that no one wants to face. 
5,197 of us killed, left behind, or simply disappeared. 5,197 of all that remains of the human race lost. The opening by the prosecution is extremely powerful. The prosecutor discusses how 5,197 people were killed or missing after the escape from New Caprica. She states that Gaius chose to allow all of this to happen, that he was happy to help the Cylons. Again, it's powerful, it's emotional, but it's important to remember that openings and closings are just stories. They aren't evidence, they aren't proof, they don't hold any legal weight. They are just wonderful tales of fancy. And again, while it's powerful and shows you the scope of what occurred, it's just a wonderful theory. There is no proof that these deaths are on Gaius' hands. Not yet, at least. Looking at the defense's opening, I honestly love it. Your Honors, the defense would like to change our plea to guilty. This man is our enemy. And if there's one thing that's good in war, that is right and just and proper, it's slaughtering our enemy. Getting some righteous payback. What are we waiting for? Let's just kill him now! Justice of the mob. It's what they want. Romo, played by the wonderful Mark Shepard, states that he wishes to change the plea to guilty. He then begins to discuss how the entire thing is a charade. People want to kill Baltar. The only justice to be had is the quote-unquote justice of the mob. He even attacks Laura Roslin, talking about how all this is something she wanted. It's a vendetta against her losing the presidency to Baltar. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not completely sure how this would work in our legal system. I know we see it on television all the time, but specifically calling someone out in an opening might warrant an objection. In theory, he could have discussed how the current sitting president wishes acts without naming names or making it so personal. But again, I don't know. Guess we'll have to wait for Legal Eagle to do a breakdown of this episode now that I've done it. Not that I'm saying he's copying me or anything. <clears throat> The defense attorney ends with the simple fact that he, and ultimately everyone, owes their lives to Gaius who wouldn't fight a battle they couldn't win. He points out that Roslyn, someone everyone looks up to, would have gotten them all killed. While I was pretty critical of the prosecutor and talking about how she was presenting a story, I think the defense did a better job here. Again, this is not evidence and can't be used as such, but his story creates reasonable doubt at this point. It is reasonable to assume that what Gaius did wasn't treason nor murder, but heroism. We'll have to see how it continues to play out, of course. We then go through a few of the witnesses. Generally, a witness has an examination and cross-examination. It doesn't occur this way in the show for dramatic purposes. So we'll look at them the way the show does. First up is Ty. The prosecution asks Ty if Baltar did anything to resist the Cylons, of which Ty says Baltar doesn't. We're going to ignore the fact that he is drunk and talking about his wife because it's irrelevant. The prosecutor is already failing at her job. The defense isn't saying that Gaius didn't help the Cylons. Cylons. The defense is saying that he had to, to keep people safe. The prosecutor is pointing out that Baltar didn't stop the oppressive nature of the Cylons? Of course he didn't. He was trying to stop genocide. So this testimony is worthless, or at worst, only helps the defense. Sure, it brings up emotions, but justice doesn't rely on emotions, and looking at the panel of judges, relying on an emotional verdict is an extreme miscalculation. We won't see more of Ty, and the next witness is Laura Roslin, who discusses being a part of the 200 people who were supposed to be executed. Now, this is actually worth something to the prosecution. This shows the intent and callous disregard for life. That said, asking Laura Roslin if Baltar did it callously is stupid. Laura wasn't a part of the administration. She wasn't there when the order was signed. She has no knowledge of it being signed by Gaius or if it was a forgery. She can speak to the attempted execution, absolutely, but beyond that, no. And how the defense handles this is, of course, idiotic. Adama points out that Laura had been taking a psychotropic drug known as Kamala. This is irrelevant. If I were the defense, it would be about her lack of knowledge on if the order was actually signed by Baltar, if she knew of it, and if she would have done it given the choice. Now, her actual answer to if she would have signed the order or not versus Baltar isn't as important as putting it into the minds of the judges. My questions would have been something around, is it true you did not see Gaius sign the execution order? Is it true that you don't know if he wanted to sign it or not? Is it not true you wouldn't have signed the order with a gun to your head? Would you agree that the Cylons would have had someone else sign it if Gaius had not? And finally, 
Would you also agree that the Cylons might have killed more people if Baltar hadn't signed it? Again, it's about the intent behind why Baltar was doing what he did. Did Baltar sign it because he wanted to? Because he didn't care? Or was he scared and trying to save lives? Or hell, maybe just his own life. He doesn't have to want to save other lives to have reasonable doubt on why he didn't do this callously. Additionally, by pointing out that he had a gun to his head puts the judges in his shoes. If Rosalind had admitted she wouldn't have signed it, even with a gun to her head, she would have looked crazy. Self-preservation is something held to the highest standard for our species, and to not sign something to save your life, even a death order, makes you look odd. After all, signing a death warrant to save yourself is only human. The next witness is, of course, Gaeta. The liar extraordinaire would claim that he was there during the signing of the death list. This is actually a bit ingenious on the prosecution's side. If Baltar says Gaeta wasn't there, then Baltar admits that he was and he did sign it. If he doesn't counter Gaeta, then the statements go unopposed. Though, to be fair, Gaeta saying he was there and that Baltar did sign it doesn't preclude that it was done under duress. I hate that they cut Gaeta off here. This is where they should have challenged the credibility of a witness. Perhaps bringing up Gaeta's attempted murder of Baltar during his previous interrogations in other episodes and discussing how Gaeta felt guilty for not resisting more than he did and letting the Cylons win. Again, we do know that Gaeta did resist, but we could point out that maybe he didn't do enough. Maybe he let the Cylons win in some instances. The point would be to attack his credibility and get him angry. This could have been really interesting, but unfortunately it was not to be. The next witness brought before us is Lee Adama, which is a waste of time. Lee simply reiterates what is said in the opening, that Gaius did what he had to do to keep everyone alive. There was nothing gained, and it's a waste of the court's time. You could argue that maybe it's a different perspective, but Lee was not on New Caprica during the occupation and is a part of the legal defense team. The only piece that he adds that is value, in my opinion, is admitting to jumping away with the other military vessels, leaving everyone to their fate. And then, on the very day when Baltar surrendered to those Cylons, I, as commander of Pegasus, jumped away. I left everybody on that planet alone, undefended, for months. I even tried to persuade the Admiral never to return, to abandon you all there for good. If I'd had my way, nobody would have made it off that planet. I'm the coward. I'm the traitor. I'd say we're very forgiving of mistakes. The defense should have put the military on trial. At least Baltar stayed and tried to stop the Cylons from killing everyone. The military, Admiral Adama, left his post and left all of them to the slaughter. Lee does bring up the blanket pardon, true, but that didn't need to be given by him. In theory, the defense would have started with this piece of paper, having the actual executive order as Exhibit A. It would have pardoned Baltar. And then, if that failed, bring up the fact that the military ran. And then after admonishing the military, explain why they needed to. The Pegasus and Galactica would have been destroyed, so leaving made the most sense. And just like the Pegasus and Galactica running for their lives, Gaius did the same thing, and he saved lives for it. Now again, I don't like that Lee is up there, but him talking about how when he was in charge of the Pegasus, him not wanting to return to New Caprica to save the people is powerful. It shows that Baltar was being as human as he was, that it's reasonable that Gaius was doing what the military did, what he needed to do to save lives and so that he wouldn't be killed himself. Lee's right. They really just wanted a scapegoat and nobody liked Baltar at this point. Baltar was dying for the sins of everyone, not just himself. And ultimately, through all of that, Baltar would be found not guilty. But was he? Should the trial have even happened? Maybe. I honestly don't think the trial here or what happened was necessarily unrealistic within the universe. With just shy of 40,000 people left and on the run from killer robots, it makes sense to want to cling to what society you had, even if I think that this entire trial was a farce. One of the things that I do enjoy about this series is the constant teardown and destruction of society that we see as time goes on. As I stated, they try to cling to what they had, but in the end, it doesn't matter. In my opinion, given what we see on trial, Baltar was not guilty. There was reasonable doubt that he was doing what he had to to survive and save others. Now, if I was to rewrite this, if I was to do the trial again, perhaps I'd focus more on aspects of how everyone did effectively what Baltar did, but just couldn't admit it. Again, they touch on this, but it would be more of an emphasis in my work. I think the Kamala with the president was a misstep and I would have removed her completely. A focus on Gaeta is where I would have went with this. Based on what we saw in these two episodes, Gaius had done what he had to, pragmatically speaking. The defense was right. Gaius had no other option. If he had tried to fight, they would have all died. The only thing to do was to be under Cylon oppression. Could Gaius have worked in the background? 
Maybe, but one could argue that doing such would only result in harsher punishments. In fact, you could argue with Gaius keeping them so busy with administrative duties, it allowed the resistance to fight and continue to fight until they couldn't. In retrospect, this probably is not what you guys expected. Maybe I should do a character breakdown of Gaius, both the reimagined and original. I don't know. What do you think? Ultimately, I did enjoy these two episodes overall. It showed a good breakdown of how courts would happen in a society that is breaking down, and it also showed the real consequences of what occurred on New Caprica. But those are my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know in the comments below.